All right. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, everybody. It is 11.30 a.m. on Wednesday, May 12th, and you are joining me here for a very special Silver Hill Grand Rounds. You will probably recognize that I am not your usual greeter, but there is a very, very good reason for that, which is that our usual greeter is the speaker today. So I have the honor of uh, welcoming you all and introducing our speaker today, who is uh, Dr. Amir Garakani. Uh, for another uh, month and a half, our Director of Education here at Silver Hill Hospital. And uh, that is bittersweet news for me because uh, we love having Amir here. He's done a phenomenal job as Director of Education as I will talk more about in just a moment. But he is going on to a wonderful leadership position uh, within the Yale system and at Greenwich Hospital as their new uh, Chairman of their Department of Psychiatry and uh, really, a, really a wonderful promotion and a wonderful opportunity, not just for Amir, I would say, but for Greenwich Hospital and ultimately for Silver Hill as well because of our ability to partner with Greenwich through, through Dr. Garakani. So very exciting times for us all. I'm gonna come back to some of that in a little bit. Uh, I know sometimes people tune in just a few minutes after 11.30, so you'll forgive me if I do a little bit of repetition. But uh, my name is Andrew Gerber. I'm the director, uh, the medical director and president of Silver Hill Hospital. And it is my great privilege uh, to be the host of Grand Rounds today uh, because our usual host, Dr. Amir Garakani, uh, is the speaker today. And Dr. Garakani will be speaking on the topic of medication treatments for anxiety disorders, where we are and where we are going. But before we get to that, I'm just gonna spend a few minutes uh, talking about Dr. Garakani. Uh, as um, anybody who's associated with Silver Hill knows, he is near and dear to us uh, as one of our uh, psychiatrists and long-term psychiatrists here, as well as uh, in the last few years, our director of education and essentially designer, architect, and host of our Grand Round series. So it's very special to have him as our speaker today. Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Garakani's background for those of you who don't know. Uh, Dr. Garakani uh, graduated with a BA in classics uh, from Cornell University, distinction in all subjects. His honors thesis, which I think you'll enjoy knowing about, is on Greek and Roman suicide love poetry. So he is, he is a Renaissance man and, and a classicist as well uh, uh, as a lover of the liberal arts and a scholar about many, many things, which is just one of the reasons that we like him so much and why his patients also uh, find him to be such a wonderful and thoughtful psychiatrist and doctor. Um, Amir went on to get his MD from SUNY Upstate in Syracuse, where he was a Rock Slicer scholarship. This is near and dear to my heart because I also was a Rock Slicer uh, winner. Uh, so, so it gives us a, a certain kinship. Uh, he then went on from upstate to complete his psychiatric residency at Mount Sinai Medical Center and a research fellowship at the Mood and Anxiety Disorders Program uh, at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. Uh, Amir's research collaborations from then, as well as from later in his career, reads like a little bit of a who's who of uh, important and influential researchers uh, uh, in the field of psychiatry. And as many of you are aware, Mount Sinai has really tremendously built up their research uh, 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 credentials over the years. And Amir has, has worked with and is friends with virtually every one of them. So whether it's Sanjay Matthew or Charlie Nemiroff, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, Amir has worked with, with all the greats there and uh, re really has been an important part of their work. Um, he, of course, was never satisfied with just being expert at one thing. He went on, despite his research uh, talents, and did a forensic psychiatry fellowship at NYU, uh, as well as getting boarded in addiction medicine, as well as preventive medicine in addiction. So he is an unusually uh, broadly trained and well-trained psychiatrist. Um, but of course, where, where the rubber hits the road is when it comes to his patients. And Amir is known throughout the Silver Hill system, and I would argue throughout the New York system, as being an attentive, thoughtful, smart, uh, and, and clear psychiatrist. And uh, I'm sure we'll be spending his whole career doing clinical work of one kind or another. But he's also a leader. And we saw that here at Silver Hill, where he rose to become an assistant medical director under my predecessor, and then uh, I had the honor of uh, hiring Amir as the director of education, 
where he really built our current Grand Rounds series. We had done some Grand Rounds, as people are aware, in the past, but he really built it into what it currently is. And he leaves that legacy for our next director of education, Jeff Katzman, who we will introduce to you at some future date. But I think Jeff has big shoes to fill. Fortunately, uh, I think Jeff, Jeff is up to it. But we are really excited to have Amir moving into the role of chairman of psychiatry at Greenwich Hospital, which is, as you know, is part of the Yale system. Amir does have uh, faculty appointments both at Yale and at Mount Sinai, which I imagine he will retain both of those. And we look forward to collaborating with Amir in his new role. Uh, I could go on. He's got you know over 65 publications, has been a co-investigator on many grants, has won many awards, both as a teacher and as a researcher, as well as a clinical psychiatrist. But more importantly, I want to turn the platform over to Amir right now to uh, give us a talk, Medication Treatments for Anxiety Disorders, where we are and where we are going. Over to you, Dr. Garakani. Great. Thank you, Dr. Gerber. Uh, I'm honored, and that was a very nice introduction, and I'm, I find that this is all quite bittersweet. I, I'm going to miss Silver Hill, but I never feel like you ever leave Silver Hill. <laughs> it feels like a place that becomes part of you, and I, I definitely want to stay part of the Silver Hill family in, in some capacity. So I'm, I'm thankful to Dr. Gerber, and Dr. Grode and everyone I've worked with here, Dr. Handler, all my colleagues, Dr. Morata. I mean, I could go on. So many wonderful colleagues and coworkers. Uh, it's, it's been amazing. Uh, Dr. Ackerman, Dr. Sandra Pietro, former your, your predecessors. It's been an amazing experience. And I, I feel a little sad, but at the same time, I'm all, all honored really to have worked here. Uh, so let me get to it because it's gonna be a lot of slides. I'm gonna do my best to not uh, rush, but I, I have a lot to get through. Uh, I have no disclosures uh, at this point financial. I have no grants, anything like that. Uh, these are the objectives. Uh, just to be brief, I'm going to try to get through as much of this as I can, but I have to kind of rush through a few things because this is a huge topic, and I don't want to try to make excuses, but you know, when I used to give a lecture to residents at Mount Sinai about this topic, it was two lectures. And you know, when Mark Pollack, one of the people who is a leader in the world of research and anxiety disorders, gives a lecture on this, it's usually split into two. So I'm trying to condense everything and I'll do my best, but um, I'll get through biology of anxiety and then we'll talk about current treatments and then we'll talk about potential novel treatments. And that's gonna be the format. Uh, so it's basically split into three, this talk. Uh, let me start by talking a little bit about High Anxiety. I don't know how many of you have seen this movie. Um, it's uh, a Mel Brooks comedy. Uh, and it's not considered one of his best, but I enjoy it. My, my father, who's a psychiatrist, uh, had me watch this movie, and it's not exactly the best portrayal of psychiatry, although I do like it, because unlike a lot of other movies, like What About Bob, uh, the psychiatrists tend to be villains or caricatures. In this movie, he doesn't ethically, Mel Brooks, who plays the head of a psychiatric hospital, ethically, he engages in some questionable behavior, like having a relationship with the daughter of a patient, but basically the plot involves a doctor who struggles with anxiety himself. And it's kind of based on a Hitchcock's vertigo and a fear of heights. And I, I thought it was really interesting because you know Dr. Gerber will appreciate this, that the institution where he works is the Psychoneurotic Institute for the Very, Very Nervous. <laughs> and what happens is basically there's a plot for the previous uh, administration were trying to keep people sick so they would stay at the hospital. And there was a character in the movie who was an industrialist who gets um, brought into Mel Brooks's office, who is the new head of the hospital. And he doesn't realize that, that the previous uh, doctor who was running the show, doc, played by Harvey Corman, was actually inducing anxiety in these patients. So this patient says, I, I suffer with neck pain and I have a fear of werewolves, nightmares about werewolves. So he, Mel Brooks is interviewing him and in the background, Harvey Corman is <laughs> putting on, you know, wear teeth like a werewolf. So uh, I found it very amusing. But the reason I'm showing this to you, not just to remind you of a of a movie about psychiatry, but is that it reminded me watching the movie. Not that this place, you know, Silver Hill is doing this to patients. I assure you, we're not. <laughs> but that, as a psychiatrist, sometimes in our zeal to help patients, um, and I've been guilty of this too, we tend to make people feel worse. 
uh, and it's unfortunate, but I have been guilty, for instance, of telling patients who ask me about side effects of medications, and I list the laundry list of side effects, and next thing I realize is that the person is terrified of taking an antidepressant. So I think that, you know, we're not putting on, you know, fangs and scaring patients, but sometimes the public has a perception that psychiatry is is making, keeping people sick so we can prescribe them meds. This is the basis of a whole anti-psychiatry movement. And I don't want us to fall victim to that, but I'm speaking to this uh, just to let all of you know that as doctors, we we have an obligation to, to be aware that um, patients are very afraid uh, to come to see doctors. So, and not just because they, they put on fangs or keep them sick. But let me talk a little bit about fear because uh, people use these terms interchangeably, fear, anxiety, what's the difference? Well. I, I like to think of it as a very simple way. Fear is, is something that's evolutionarily built into all creatures, animals, humans, um, and it's a response to a known, definite, external, identifiable threat, whereas anxiety is a response to some sort of unclear, internal, or vague threat. The example I would give is a person who is afraid of getting on a subway would have a fear of getting on the subway at that moment. But if you are in your apartment in New York getting thinking the night before about getting on the subway, um, having anxiety at, at that moment is anxiety because you're not having fear because you're not actually on the subway. An example I give is, and I don't wanna get into a whole semantic argument about whether animals can experience anxiety or not, because I'm sure some people will, will say, well, it's not really anxiety, is it fear? But I don't think that dogs who are afraid of going to the vet are sitting you know, at, at their owner's house or apartment, having anxiety about going to the vet the next day because the dog doesn't know. And I think that's one of the things, you know, Kierkegaard and philosophers have talked about what anxiety is. And, you know, advanced creatures develop anxiety partly because of our high intellectual capacity. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the biology of that. But basically, all, all animals experience fear and all humans experience fear and anxiety. And it functions as a physiologic warning, and it's built into our systems as something that's to protect us. And people who have anxiety may be at less of a risk to developing certain diseases because they're more careful about the foods they eat or avoiding dangerous things like riding motorcycles, for instance. So, um, you know, anxiety can serve a positive function. Um, you can call it caution. Some people may cause it, call it anxiety. But it's when anxiety becomes persistent that it can be maladaptive. And I think that's the key that I want to talk about. It's not to, to talk about, well, everyone who has anxiety, we need to address it. No, if it's, if it's a problem, then yes, we should address it. And if it starts interfering with functioning, and that's what I'm going to get into is, is, is it disordered anxiety? Does it interfere with your ability to go to school, go to work, to be healthy physically and mentally, to maintain healthy relationships, things like that. So, um, I don't think my brother's watching this. I don't think he signed up, but that's my brother. I'm going to show you here. That's my brother and that's me. And for those of you who've never met my brother, he's a, he's a little person. He's a dwarf. Um, he's older than I am. And in this picture, I believe I'm around a year old, maybe younger, like between nine and 12 months. And my brother is about two years older than I am. And this is in Manhattan. And ignore the fact that there are no like guards on the windows or anything like that. This was Manhattan in the 70s. Um, but I, I put, posted this picture on social media a few years ago, and one of my good buddies, uh, a doctor named Rob, who I went to medical school with, um, he noted, he said, I, I love the look in your eyes, the anxiety that's, that's you know, piercing through you. And I said, well, that's fear. <laughs> uh, I said, it's not really anxiety, and it, it was fear. But it is interesting that he noted that because I, I realized that I, I've become very good at at giving off a very strong fear response. I, I recall during my residency, uh, I, I was in a, in a pharmaceutical lunch. It was at noon or something. And I, I, I trained in Mount Sinai, as Dr. Gerber said, and it was some French bistro. And the second floor was uh, a pharma lunch back when they used to have those. And I mean, they still have them, but you know, it's much less common and residents wouldn't get invited nowadays. But the, here we were a bunch of psych residents at this bistro and there was a booth and I get kind of shuffled into the middle of the booth and I start to have a panic attack. And a good friend of mine, Larry, who's a classmate of mine in residency who had worked with me for months on internal medicine rotations and gotten to know about my anxieties and my phobias, just sees my eyes and sees that, that look that I have in my eyes of like frozen fear. 
And he makes some excuse and says, oh, Mir, you want to switch seats so I can see the speaker? He manages to get me out of this situation. Um, so the reason I bring this up is that I've been dealing with anxiety my whole life. So when patients tell me, oh, you don't know what it's like to have a panic attack, I go, oh, yeah, I do. <laughs> I definitely do. Um, I, can't, I can't lie and say I didn't have some anxiety this morning about giving this talk, but I feel as if, you know, Dr. Gerber said it best, you know, I'm not only you know, the, the, the founder of the anxiety club for, you know, for doctors, but I'm a, you know, I'm a client too. I, I feel like um, this is something that's very personal to me. So, you know, I, I've learned that exposure is one way to overcome that. This dog who, um, you know, is in doggy heaven, I would imagine, was, you know, kind of a little demon beast, you know, scared me as a Pekingese named Nanushka. And this is back when we were living in that same building. She, this, this, our neighbors are, of ours had this dog that would scare my brother and me. And my parents, you know, as my father, a psychiatrist, my mother who trained in mental health and psychology, both said, you know, you need to confront your fears. So I did. And you got this picture of me with this, this uh, dog that uh, I have to admit scared me. It doesn't look very menacing, I would imagine, but as a child, it, it was definitely scary. I don't know how old I am in this picture, but Anyway, I, I've learned that confronting your fears is really the, and, and getting treatment is really important. So I'll talk a little bit about how, you know, we, 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 we approach treatment, you know, and I think exposure therapy and cognitive therapies are really important and I'm not trying to discount. I'll talk a little bit about it, but the focus of this talk is medications. And I wanna be clear that I never think that it's sufficient just to give people medications and call it a day. I think so much about anxiety treatment is the psychological and psychobehavioral aspects of it. But I, today's talk is going to focus on medication. So, um, what is stress? I mean, I also let you know that I'm going to rush through the slides, but I will let you know that. Um, sorry about that. That the um, that what we're going to do is give you a handout. So don't feel like you have to rush to to write anything down or keep notes on it. I'm going to get through as much as as I can, but. I wanted to talk a little bit about you know stress and how people experience stress. So, you know the adaptation syndrome, which is you have a stress response, and the alarm reaction, which is the fight or flight response, as you know, is you know, your your sympathetic nervous system acts up in response to some fear, like you know a wild animal is in the room or someone's holding a gun at you, um, and you have a fight or flight response. Um, and you know, one of the models of anxiety that was developed by Donald Klein, someone that my father worked with and I had a ch chance to work with, it's called like the father of psychopharmacology He's since passed away. Um, but he was one of the early pioneers in, in anxiety and especially panic research. And he developed the idea of a respiratory uh, false suffocation alarm. And this has been modified over the years because it's not just a respiratory response to panic. But over time, you, you, you develop over, overused alarm system and your body develops a resistance to it and the decreased catecholamines, which are things like norepinephrine and, uh, and epinephrine and serotonin. And your body eventually switches to glucocorticoids and you develop an exhaustion. And one of the things I wanna talk about is the thing that I've noticed about people with severe anxiety is that they seem exhausted and physically. It's like you know, having panic, constant anxiety and panic causes you know, a weakening of your immune system and your stress responses. It's, it's incredible. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the different, um, the different types of anxiety states. And we'll talk a little bit about biology of anxiety in a moment. So an anxiety state is I'm having anxiety now. An anxiety trait is a personality, an anxiety style that people develop. Um, it's important to remember that you can have anxiety that's situation dependent, which are specific phobias, like I have a fear of spiders or of crowds um, or, or speaking in public or enclosed spaces, which is claustrophobia. Or you can have, uh, without provocation anxiety, free-floating anxiety. And in fact, for panic disorder, one of the requirements for DSM diagnosis is that you have panic attacks that are, that are sudden, that they're not triggered by like having to drive over a bridge or, you know, be exposed to heights or something like that, or situational. Uh, so um, people with anxiety might experience psychological or somatic symptoms or both. Sometimes people, this is the big problem with treating anxiety in 
the stigma around anxiety is that people say, well, I don't know if you're anxious. You don't look anxious. Um, it's, it's the, you know, hidden wounds. I mean, even people with depression can manifest really marked symptoms of like, you know, furrowed brow, hunching over, facies that make them look like they're anxious. But I had patients who, you know, I'm having a panic attack and they're not lying to me. They're having panic, but they look like they're not smiling, but they seem to have normal facial expressions. They're not showing obvious symptoms, tremulousness, twitching, anything of that nature. So then there's worry, which is kind of complicated because the worry is kind of a building of, of a negative affective state where there is a person trying to basically solve a problem without any real certain solution. And worry is a big part of generalized anxiety disorder, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about. Um, the evolution of fear systems. So as I talked a little bit about, it's something that's built into animals is to have a fear system, which is based in the amygdala. And uh, Joseph Ledoux, who was at NYU and a, basically one of the, the biggest experts in, in fear and anxiety, and I'll talk a little bit about him and his research. Uh, he has a band, he's a musician, he has a band called the Amygdaloids, which is really interesting. But so he, he basically animals and humans have this fear system built in and the animal model that we use to study anxiety is based on fear conditioning. And I worked on a really interesting paper with Dr. Charney, Dennis Charney at Mount Sinai and Sanjay Matthew in 2006, which talks about fear conditioning responses. And it was in the Mount Sinai Journal of Medicine. And if anyone's interested, I could send you a copy of the paper because I think it was a really good synopsis of how people develop fear. Um, and there's a whole model in animals about fearful faces and stimuli and how you can develop an extinction, extinction to fear responses. And there's a lot of imaging work. I'm not going to get into it, but it's a huge literature on, on studying people anxiety. And when I was at Sinai working with Jack Gorman, who was the chair at the time and is a, an expert in anxiety disorders and was my mentor for many years, you know, he and I were doing research and I was writing grants on a project to give people a respiratory stimulant called doxapram to induce panic attacks in patients with panic disorder while we image them using PET imaging. And Monty Buxbaum from, uh, who's now at UC San Diego was the person who was doing the imaging side. And if I tell people that they think, oh, that's horrible. Why would you <laughs> induce panic in people? But it's because we were trying to study the models of fear and anxiety. And I think it's, you know, it's helpful to understand what causes anxiety in people with panic disorder and without. Um, but there's a lot of research on this. I'm just not gonna have a lot of time to get into it. Um, but basically the prefrontal cortex is the area of the brain that's responsible for higher level functionings uh, related to fear and to anxiety, but mainly worry. And something that I think the reason that you don't, your dog isn't sitting there worrying about going to the doctor's office or whether or not you're gonna be able to pay his, his uh, bills or keep the, the house you know, heated and his, his kibble supply full is that the, the dog probably doesn't have the highest level of prefrontal cortical function. But this is a, as I said, this is an, this is an effect of, of having these high level functions. Um, that doesn't mean of course that because children and adolescents don't have them as fully developed systems that they can't also have um, anxiety. Of course, anxiety can develop in children, but Danny Pine, Dr. Pine, who was at, at NIMH and gave a talk two years ago, talked a lot about the development of anxiety. And I don't have a lot of time to do that today, but basically childhood anxiety has to be treated as different than what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to focus more on adult anxiety and I'm not gonna talk about children because it's a whole other topic that you know, I think is, is worth discussing, but not every child who has anxiety during childhood will develop into adulthood and not every a child who doesn't have anxiety will not later on develop it. So it's important to understand that. It is familial, there is a genetic aspect, but it's complicated. It's not like Huntington's disease where there's a clear you know, autosomal dominant transmission, it's multifactorial. Um, so this is the biologic, it's complicated, it's confusing, but basically it involves the prefrontal cortex, the insula, uh, Dr. Martin Paulus talks a lot about the insula's role in anxiety. I'm not gonna get too much into all of this, basically to understand that this is a complicated system involving many, many areas of the brain, including the hypothalamus, locus ceruleus. Um, and there's a lot of, of different you know, biological responses that take place in an anxiety response. It isn't a very simple straight line. Um, but one of the things I want to point out, this is from Dr. Ledoux and Dr. Pines, I think a really important paper that came out in 2016. It talks about how the fear and circuits 
which were thought to be separate from the cognitive circuits, their belief is that the two systems work concurrently. And I think that this is important to remember that it isn't that you have a fear response and then you have a separate cognitive response to, to a threat. The two are working in sync. And I think this is what the basic of their two system model. And I think this is important to remember because they're not saying that as you know that the two that they're two separate pathways or like that they don't play an important role with one another but it's important to remember that all the systems are connected uh together um and i also want to talk a little bit about how treating anxiety in a vacuum is really hard when patients come to me and say well i have anxiety you know it's very difficult because a lot of the patients have depression as well especially people with generalized anxiety and people have you know treating patients with bipolar disorder i was i had slides in originally about talking about treating patients with anxiety and bipolar disorder but it's very hard to, to talk about that in a very busy topic um dr joseph goldberg a mentor of mine he and i are, were supposed to give a talk about this at the apa meeting last year before COVID. but stay tuned i think that there's a lot to be said about that with schizophrenia personality disorders adhd can be mistaken for anxiety and vice versa and substance use disorders there's a lot of comorbidity with alcohol use disorders and panic disorder um, but the reason i bring this up is that i think it's important to do a good history i had a patient who came into silver hill she was treated she did very well i started seeing her privately and she came in she said my anxiety is worse dr g and i look in her bag and she has two cans of Red Bull. <laughs> so she's just chugging these caffeinated drinks. And I said, well, maybe take it easy with the caffeine. You know, we use that, we used to use that to induce panic in patients. Uh, so, you know, patients use cocaine and amphetamines that can also worsen anxiety, hallucinogens, cannabis. I'll talk about cannabis later. Or also the person's in alcohol withdrawal, which I had a patient who came in to see me for anxiety, he wasn't a Silver Hill patient. I did a a little bit of a deep dive and I noticed that he was tremulous when he'd come to appointments and he I said are you drinking he said no I I said can I speak to your wife he said sure his wife said oh he's drinking a bottle every night so he was actually going through benzodiazepine withdrawal or intoxication potentially because uh, it can also cause anxiety in patients so taking a good history drug testing people um, in some cases talking to collateral sources is important looking for medical explanations I can't tell you how many times I've had patients come to me and were sent by their primary care doctors or neurologists or other people who said, oh, this person's having anxiety, it's in their head. Well, possibly, but it, they could also be having a pulmonary embolism or they could be having a thyroid condition. One of my patients who, she did have anxiety, but it was getting worse. And I had her on an antidepressant, uh, escitalopram. She was, seemed to be doing well, but her anxiety kept ramping up. Turns out she had thyroid disease. So um, she had hyperthyroidism, which can cause anxiety. So there are things that you need to look for, like things like pheochromocytoma are extremely rare. There's what we call in medical practice uh, zebras, but just to be aware and to, to not, and this, is, this doesn't happen with psychiatry because if people come to us, we tend to be pretty uh, careful and compassionate and listen to them, but this may happen in, in other areas of medicine where people will not listen to patients and who are saying, you know, I'm having chest pain and not bother to actually check if the person is having a myocardial infarction, you know, or has a thyroid issue or a tumor. Um, infectious diseases, Lyme, I can't tell you how many times patients had undiagnosed Lyme. Uh, COVID, um, I think I can't really get into so much about this because this is fairly new, but there is definitely a link between people de not developing, but possibly developing, but definitely having worsening of their anxiety and depressive symptoms after developing COVID. And not, a, not the vaccine, but the infection. This is a complicated way of basically saying that the anxiety disorders kind of don't fit into neat boxes. And I just wanted to point that out because there are certain people who internalize their anxiety and it can may come out as fear or just anxious misery. And you can see this is based on a DSM-4 model. So I wouldn't put much stock in this, but I just wanted to point out that there was a lot of discussion about generalized anxiety disorder not really fitting in with the other anxiety disorders in terms of necessarily how, um, how much of a correlation there is with symptoms, because there's a lot of generalized anxiety patients experience depression more so than people with panic. Um, here are the anxiety disorders in DSM panic, agoraphobia, which used to be linked with panic disorder, specific phobias, social anxiety, and generalized anxiety disorder. I'm just going to focus on these in terms of 
anxiety treatments. And you may notice that there isn't a lot of research or medication options for specific phobias. That's because there just isn't. There tend to be kind of limited to a specific event and treated therapeutically. But I'll talk a little bit about that. Why am I not including OCD and PTSD? Well, obsessive compulsive disorder is, is separate. It used to be part of DSM-4 under the anxiety disorders, as did post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, but they are now considered separate. And I pointed out this, uh, this uh, as a means of letting you know that, that this is, shows a strong correlation. For instance, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder have a strong genetic correlation, major depressive and anxiety disorders. But you can see that anxiety disorders don't have necessarily the strongest correlation with PTSD or OCD. Um, they're diagnostically distinct. Even though the symptoms of post-traumatic stress may look like generalized anxiety or panic disorder, it's important to take a good history. And as I said, I don't have enough time to go into PTSD because it's a whole other topic in and of itself. So I'm not going to talk about these. These are the other anxiety disorders in DSM, but as I said, let's focus on ones that have you know, more salience. Why do we want to talk about anxiety disorders? Well, if you look here, this is from the uh, from the National Comorbidity Survey. I couldn't find a more updated version of it. This was done back in the mid-2000s. So this is from 2007, but you can see the prevalence of, um, of anxiety disorders, 31% lifetime prevalence, which makes it amongst the most common. If you look at substance use disorders, you can see that they're greater, but that's mainly due to the effects of nicotine dependence. But anxiety disorders are the most common class of, of psychiatric disorders. Um, as I said, most prevalent, low rates of people seeking treatment, high rates of disability, cost burdens to society, and people have worse outcomes. If you have a patient with depression and they come to your office for treatment, if they have a comorbid anxiety disorder, it's they're more likely to have resistance to treatment, have a harder time getting appropriate treatment. Same thing with patients with bipolar disorder or schizophrenia who also have anxiety. So these are the types of treatments. These are the, you know, we're not gonna talk about psychotherapies and we're not gonna get much into medication and psychotherapy, but these are the medications that we're gonna talk about. Benzodiazepines, the antidepressants, Azaparones, anticonvulsants, antipsychotics, other medications. And then we're going to talk later, obviously, about new treatments. Let's talk about GABA. So, what's GABA? GABA, some of you might know what GABA is from, they sell supplements that are basically GABA modulating, GABA enhancing medications that are over the counter. Um, basically, GABA is the inhibitory neurotransmitter of the central nervous system. And glutamate is the excitatory neurotransmitter. And Glutamate is formed into GABA, so they're very much connected. Let's talk about benzodiazepines. So benzos, as we call them in colloquial terms, are agonists of the GABA-A receptor and work to increase the opening time of the channels. And they modulate, meaning they don't act directly on the GABA receptor, but they modulate the receptor, which puts them in contrast with barbiturates, the older class, which had a more direct effect and ir irreversible effect on the receptors, which is why barbiturates are more potentially lethal in overdose um, and uh, more potentially dangerous to combine with other medications. Um, what is the history of benzos? I could go into this, but I cut out the slide just in the matter of, of, of time, but benzodiazepines were developed in the 1950s. And there was a huge surge of interest in benzodiazepines throughout the 70s. They were the primary treatment for anxiety disorders for many years. My father will tell you this. Um, diazepam um, and uh, chlordazepoxide, or, or what's called Librium. These medications were the, the standard treatment for anxiety for many years. And Dr. Petrus Lavunas last week pointed out very well that during the 70s and 80s and 90s, it, until, the, until the SSRIs and other antidepressants came into full view, benzodiazepines were still considered the first line gold standard treatment for panic, generalized anxiety, socialized, social anxiety disorders. And that was basically it. Uh, now, in terms of this task force, this was a response to concerns about abuse during the 1980s and a feeling that these medications could cause risks to patients so the task force response to it was to basically say they're not drugs of abuse. I, the, the word not, I, I, uh, I uh, added the uh, caps to that. Uh, and it said among people who are not abusing substances. So they kind of qualified it. And they're basically saying that it's an appropriate treatment, but you have to consider the options, which I, I can understand 
now is a cautious statement, but it can certainly look like hedging. And I can understand that I was in high school when this report came out, so I can't speak to, to the impact it had. But I do think there is a lot of concern about when I when I look at this, and we'll talk a little bit about the controversies, but about how benzodiazepines are perceived in, in the field. But I'll talk about that in a minute. They're still the most widely prescribed medications, and, and alprazolam, which goes by the brand name Xanax, is the most widely prescribed psychiatric medication. Same thing in the world. Um, and they're also most widely prescribed by primary care doctors. If you look at data, um, I some of the data I looked at is older, but in terms of like collecting data on prescribing from databases, the most common prescriber of, of benzodiazepines are primary care doctors, internists, general practitioners, family doctors. Um, look at prescribing patterns. And this was, you know, this was back from you know 2008, but I think that um, the data has supported this. This is not a good trend. This basically shows that the older you get, the more likely you are to be prescribed a benzodiazepine. And that is exactly the opposite of how it should be because benzodiazepines create bigger risks for people who are you know 60s, 70s, and 80s in terms of falls and cognitive issues. So this is kind of a concerning trend, but I just will talk a little bit more about that. This is the structure of benzodiazepines. Uh, clinical effects, well, they have anti-anxiety effects. They're sedating. Um, midazolam, or which goes by Versed, is used in, as an anesthetic, especially for people getting electroconvulsive therapy. Uh, they're used for sleep. There's a whole you know, group of, of uh, sedative uh, benzodiazepines. I'm not going to talk about Zolpidem and the so-called Z drugs, but they work more directly on the sleep centers. And they also pose risks in terms of abuse potential. So, but again, another topic for another day. They can be used for muscle relaxation. In fact, in neurology um, and in in you know surgery and you know in physical medicine, physiatry, there it can be used for muscle relaxation. But a tolerance can develop. And they also have anti-emetic effects, which is a positive, uh, but they're not used primarily for that purpose. They're used for seizures um, as anticonvulsants. Um, they can cause amnesia. Obviously, there's not use for that purpose, but um, in some cases, people have used it and uh, for, for that effect. Um, cognitive impairment is a clinical effect. There is an equivocal link with dementia. One of the biggest fears you see is people read articles in you know, newspapers, magazines about do benzodiazepines cause dementia? And there was a there was a lot of research that was done on this. Follow-up studies show that maybe the data is not as convincing and it was limited to certain populations or certain medications. I do tell people that it can definitely cause some issues with cognition, without a doubt. I've seen it. In fact, I recently saw it in a young man who was using large amounts of benzodiazepines and barbiturates along with marijuana, but um, the, the test, psych testing seemed to support that the, the benzodiazepines definitely played a role in affecting his cognition. Are, are these effects reversible? We don't know exactly, but there definitely can be issues with effects on cognition. Um, it can cause incoordination and ataxia, which is effect on the cerebellum, similar to the way the alcohol can. Um, it can cause uh, dry mouth, headache, dizziness, uh, something to keep in mind. Obviously, you don't want people driving and taking benzodiazepines. That's a warning on the bottle. Um, respiratory depression. I, I'm not going to show a slide again in the interest of time, but this is a huge problem. Benzodiazepines um, combined with medications like opioids have led to a humongous problem of overdose deaths. And it's something to keep in mind. And obviously, all the prescription databases make you keep track of these things. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, what is it used for? Well, it's used for generalized anxiety. There's some contention about whether or not they're, in fact, more effective than uh, than SSRIs and tricyclic. Generalized anxiety disorder tends to be one that if you have a patient taking just clonazepam, for instance, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think benzodiazepines can be quite effective for generalized anxiety, but according to the guidelines that have been developed, they're not considered the first line treatment. Um, using them with panic, it's recommended that they're used as an adjunct, usually starting when you start someone on a medication for panic, like say fluoxetine or Prozac, you would normally start them on clonazepam as well to help them with their initial anxiety and panic symptoms. Uh, other indications, I'm not gonna go through this, but they're used for seizures, mania, catatonia, they're very effective. Obviously you're using alcohol with, and benzodiazepine withdrawals when people come to the hospital. 
these are the medications. I'm not going to go into this is the names of the medications and their brand names and the dose ranges. Again, I'll make my slides available, but I just wanted to make you aware of what the medications are that are used for anxiety. Um, I've, it's a curiosity. I don't know why if people know why they develop wafers, which are the dissolving tablets. Um, I, I thought it was because of absorption or or um, other you know reasons, something to do with the pharmacokinetics of, of the medication or something. But it actually is because the company wanted a person to be able to take a medication in a surreptitious way if they're having a panic attack so they don't need water. So you put it on your tongue, it dissolves. I thought that was very interesting. These are, so these are bars. Um, these are these are highly abused, addicting, you know, types of medications. I, I, I do think that, you know, I use Alprazolam and Xanax for patients. I don't want to just say that everybody abuses it, but clearly there's a whole culture. They have their own names. Um, I've seen these before when I worked in the admitting office here, patients would sometimes have these among their belongings. Um, but these are unfortunately become common street drugs, which kind of cloud the fact that they're actually very effective medications when used safely and appropriately under the care of a doctor. Footballs. So they are schedule four, meaning that there's five schedules. One are drugs that uh, don't have any medical indication. Um, even cocaine is schedule two because it can be used in anesthetic and certain other settings. Uh, schedule four means that you have to, you know, check the, the prescription database for it. Um, and some states will allow you to put in refills. New York won't. Connecticut has, although I don't normally put in refills on benzodiazepines, but um, some states do allow you to put refills on it, but you have to check the database. So these are controlled substances, but they're not ranked in as high schedule as something like, say, stimulants like the dextroamphetamine, quote unquote, Adderall medications, which are schedule two. Uh, so there are more restrictions on it. Um, tapering them slowly. Slowly. That's basically the, the thing. And you always switch them to a longer acting medication. That tends to be the better approach. Uh, controversy. Well, I will say that benzodiazepines are, if you look at the old generation, I don't call them old, but you know, people who have been practiced for 30, 40 years who grew up using these medications, like Dr. Ballin and Dr. Rickles, who I, I both spoken with, and Dr. Rickles and I, who's at used to be at UPenn, he's emeritus there. They're part of the old guard protecting you know, benzodiazepines against people like Dr. Moore here, who's writing about how we need to restrict them to prescribing only to, to psychiatrists and not have primary care doctors doing it. Um, and it's, it's just, it's, you, you don't want to get caught in the middle of this. I submitted a paper on, on benzodiazepine teaching on how it's being taught. I did, it was a survey of residents throughout the country, and I submitted it to a psych journal. And I wrote a few comments about the concerns about giving benzodiazepines given some of the risks. And the paper got skewered because clearly one of the reviewers was very much pro benzodiazepines and was basically made me take out all the, um, the language about potential risks and kind of neutered my paper a little bit uh, in the discussion. But the crux of the paper was that residents in psychiatry are being taught to be cautious about this. I don't think that's the problem. I think the issue at hand is more about um, other specialties and also some of the older generations of psychiatrists who are very comfortable using it. Um, my only advice would be, and I've actually told one of these generational doctors who's very pro benzodiazepines, I said, come work at Silver Hill for a few months and tell me how you feel about, about it. Because it's very easy to, to sort of look at it in your own little world where all your patients you know, don't seem to have substance problems. But if you start dealing with a patient that are primarily here because of drug and alcohol addictions, you take a different view on it. I happen to have softened on it, and I'm not so opposed to prescribing it to patients, even those with substance histories, but I think you have to be really cautious. Simple as that. Um, the American Psychiatric Association guidelines, basically, the reason I brought this up is that, you know, NICE, which is in Europe, and CANMAT, which is the Canadian guidelines, have different guidelines, but they're all basically have similar recommendations, which are, you know, the SSRIs are recommended as first-line treatments. Um, combining CBT with medications, there's no evidence that it actually is beneficial to one or the other, which sounds counterintuitive, but it, it, should, it does actually make sense if you think about it. Um, again, I'm not going to talk about the psychotherapy so much, but I just wanted to let you know that CBT has pretty strong evidence for it. So there are cases where medications might not even be you know, in consideration, but I think that's a choice you have to present to the patients. 
these are the classes of medications. Just to go quickly through it, SSRIs um, can cause you know, nausea, diarrhea, headaches. Usually these are short acting side effects that go away. The sexual dysfunction is not one that goes away necessarily and it is dose dependent. Um, same thing with SNRIs, although you have to be careful about hypertension with, with those medications. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Tricyclics are kind of the old school medications that were the, the treatments that were used before we, we had the option to use SSRIs. And the reason they've fallen out of favor, although some doctors love using them, especially neurologists love using it for headaches and pain uh, issues. Uh, the problem is, is that you have to watch for dry mouth. These are anticholinergic side effects, um, constipation. Um, also cardiac arrhythmias. And the big fear you have is that these medications are potentially fatal in overdose, whereas SSRIs are safer. So there are tolerability concerns. Interestingly, the one of the early studies on using tricyclics in, in anxiety disorders, my father was first author on a paper on using amipramine in panic with Dr. Klein. That was back in 1984. This is, these are the, the SSRI medications and their indications. I only point this out to say that if you have a patient who wants to take citalopram for panic disorder, it's fine. You don't necessarily have to worry that that doesn't have an FDA indication. A lot of this has to do with whether or not the company went for an FDA approval. And I wouldn't put too much stock in it. It doesn't necessarily mean that the medication isn't efficacious or effective for that. So um, if you're using things off label, we'll talk about that a little bit. It's a different story, but this is, eh, I don't think you're gonna get too much of a problem if you give someone you know, with, uh, you know, with panic disorder escitalopram, just because it's not approved. I think you'll be okay. Um, these are the SNRIs. Same sort of thing. Um, antipsychotics. So I want to go through this very quickly. Basically, trifluoperazine, which goes by the name Stelazine, is approved for use in anxiety, but this is a first-generation antipsychotic. I have not seen it used all that often. Um, these are the second-generation antipsychotics. Very quickly, what are they approved for? Schizophrenia, psychosis, psychotic disorders, bipolar disorder, bipolar depression, mania, agitation and as augmentation for major depression. Uh, there, are, there are no other anxiety indications, um, not to say that they haven't been studied for, for anxiety disorders, but if you look at the side effects, you know, it's, it's a long list. And I think for most patients, the, the risks usually outweigh the benefits. And I think that there has to be some caution about using them, but let me give you a little overview. The best evidence for using antipsychotics is using quetiapine, which goes by the brand name Seroquel, in generalized anxiety disorder. And this is based on several systematic reviews that show that it is quite effective compared to placebo. But there is concerns about its side effects. As I mentioned, weight gain, something called the metabolic syndrome. Um, you can develop neuroleptic malignant syndrome even on low doses. Um, and in terms of tolerability, I mean, patients find it to be very sedating. And, uh, and it's just something that patients don't wanna take during the day when they're having anxiety or panic. Um, even though the CANMAT, as I mentioned, the Canadian guidelines do recommend augmentation, um, this is not something that's recommended on, under most you know, guidelines, or it's not the standard of practice necessarily, but they're still commonly used. Um, research has shown that they are being prescribed to people with anxiety disorders. I'm not talking about OCD and PTSD, which there is clear evidence for using them and more research. I'm talking about get generalized anxiety, panic, social anxiety. So I'm doing a, a study um, it's, it's already registered under a site called Prospero for systematic reviews. I'm doing a systematic review with some of my colleagues who were going to study um, the use of antipsychotics in what's called an umbrella review, overview of all the systematic reviews to see how much, how much research and data there is on this. I imagine that it's limited, but I'm curious to know how common it is being prescribed and whether patients really understand the risks. But I think it's important that they understand them. Uh, to move on, azaparone, buspar, buspirone, it's used in anxiety. It's approved for anxiety. And I use it mainly as an adjunct treatment. The important thing to remember is to tell patients not to take it as needed. Sometimes patients think, oh, it's like a taking um, benzodiazepine. It's not. You need to take it standing. Um, it can cause some tolerability issues. But I've, I've come around on it. 
I feel like it's not necessarily helpful to people who've already taken benzodiazepines and the research seems to support that. But if you have someone who hasn't been on benzodiazepines who's fairly naive, I think that there is a potential benefit. And there's some research that shows that maybe it, in, it improves libido for people who are taking SSRIs, although that's, that's not been shown yet. Um, Anticonvulsants. You don't need to worry about this slide. A lot going on here other than just realize that there's there, these are the medications, carbamazepine, lamotrigine, which is, goes by the name of Lamictal. Basically, all you need to focus on is pregabalin, which is PGB, is the one that has the greatest amount of evidence. One means that there is a high level of research evidence uh, supporting it, I mean, studying it. Um, so let's talk about pregabalin. It goes by the name Lyrica. It's approved for nerve pain, neuralgia, partial seizures, and fibromyalgia. It's excreted through the kidneys. It can cause dizziness, sedation, potentially a mild withdrawal, which means that if you want to, if you put someone on it and they're taking it, you need to taper it, but not as slowly as benzodiazepines, but not immediately. Um, it's Schedule Five, meaning it is a controlled medication. Uh, you have to check the database. But um, what's interesting is is that um, is that gabapentin, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, is not uh, scheduled. There is evidence of misuse and toxic effects, including some, some studies I saw showing that it, there are higher rates of overdoses when it's combined with opioids, which makes sense. Um, it's approved for, for GAD or generalized anxiety in Europe, which is you know, based on a multiple very positive studies um, and a systematic review and meta-analysis, but the FDA tried did, did not approve Pfizer's attempt to get FDA approval for it. Um, it has better bioavailability than gabapentin, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Problem is cost. If you prescribe it for someone for anxiety, it is not FDA approved. You have to document, use off-label, and let the patient know that they'll probably have to pay out of pocket for it because, as I said, it's only if you're prescribing it for nerve pain, it's a different story. Gabapentin. Uh, it's it's if you talk to people in anxiety treatment, they've probably heard about gabapentin. I think if you took out all the charts of all my patients and you threw a, you know, a dart at it and hit a chart, chances are the patient will be on gabapentin. I have to admit, I, I'm fond of it. Um, it's not approved for any anxiety disorders, but it is used off-label. Uh, and basically the company, Pfizer, I remember this as a resident, um, they got sued because the reps were going around telling people that it's great and it can be used for all different things, depression, bipolar, anxiety. Um, and it turned out that um, they were marketing it for non-indicated use, which is a big no-no. Um, interestingly enough, though, it's come around where we found that it has anxiolytic effects, and it's been used increasingly in hospitals, for instance, for alcohol withdrawal or for patients with alcohol or cannabis cravings, uh, based on some pre preliminary data that's showing it might be helpful. But there's limited study in anxiety disorders. There are a couple of trials, a couple of open label, and a couple of controlled trials, but the truth is, is that it, yeah, I can't really say for sure that you know there's great efficacy research on it, even though I'm using it, you know, off-label based on my own personal clinical experience, which I think goes a long way. But I'm keeping in mind, I tell the patients the research doesn't necessarily support it. Um, you can dose it two to four times a day, as needed or standing. You can get up very high on the doses. Um, a good thing about it is patients who have liver disease and a lot of them with alcoholism do. It goes through the kidneys. There is a problem, it's not really bioavailable. They have newer formulations of gabapentin that have better bioavailability, obviously more expensive, um, dry mouth constipation, weight gain, more likely at higher doses. I have some, seen some people gain weight and also ankle edema, definitely something I've noticed more and more, I guess, because we're prescribing it more. It's fine, you just stop the medicine, these symptoms go away. Um, you wouldn't want to just stop it. Suddenly some people do develop withdrawal, is there abuse potential? Absolutely. Um, but I still think in situations where you're looking at a patient with anxiety, do I give them a benzodiazepine or give them gabapentin? I think most of my colleagues who work here who have experience with addiction and most people in the community would say, well, you should teach them coping skills or get them on an SSRI. I'm like, well, sometimes we do both those things and it's still not enough. Um, but we do want to discourage people from taking a pill as one of my colleagues um, who works in dialectical behavioral therapy would say, skills, not pills. Um, I, I always want to correct her. I say, well, we don't have a problem with pills that they're like, you know, antidepressants. It's just not a pill. Like, give me something. I need something. I need something. Um, but there are other medications I want to talk briefly about. Mirtazapine or Remeron, limited research. It may be used as an adjunct. 
um, nefazidone limited study, uh, MAOI, uh, which are uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. These are last resort type treatments. I know some people say, you know, you should use them, but there's so many problems with, you have to get, you have to wait weeks of getting someone off of a serotonin medication because there can be a serotonin syndrome. You have to taper them off, wait weeks, start the medication. They have to be on a strict diet, a tyramine diet. There are issues in terms of side effects of the medication, tolerability of them. So this is reserved for, for more severe cases, but even getting patients, and I've had severe cases, but getting patients to go along with it, it's risky. I'm not going to talk much about Wellbutrin other than it can be an adjunct. Um, also can be used for treat anxiety in a short term. Um, and it, low doses tend to be better, but um, there's not a lot of research on it. But it was thought to make anxiety worse, not necessarily the case. Um, antihistamines, uh, hydroxyzine or Vistaril, this is basically similar to, to, to diphenhydramine or Benadryl, but it's a prescription string. There is some research on it. It's safe in that people tend to develop tolerance to it, but it doesn't, it's not addicting or habit forming, but you have to be careful about like dry mouth sedation, constipation. I wouldn't encourage using it in elderly patients because it can contribute to confusion. Um, and it's usually too sedating for people to take regularly during the day. Um, propranolol, people like using this for pre-test anxiety or social anxiety situations when you report before you have to go out into a public space. Um, the research doesn't really support it, but uh, I still prescribe it to patients and situations can find it to be helpful. You have to watch their blood pressure though. Um, clonidine, same thing. You got to watch your blood pressure. There have been increasing cases of people taking too much clonidine, falling over, getting really sedated. We primarily use it for opioid withdrawals in psychiatric settings for, for patients who we're either using buprenorphine or methadone to taper people, or they don't want to take that, we give them clonidine, but you have to watch their blood pressure closely. It is also approved for treating ADHD along with guanfacine in children. It may have some benefit to, to treating that as opposed to stimulants, but in my experience, patients don't tend to find them as effective, but I'm not here to talk about ADHD. So treatment strategies, what do we do? Start low, go slow. Simple as that, start low, go slow. Um, you may need to put people on a small dose of a benzodiazepine, but that's fine. I really don't think it's a big problem to give people benzodiazepines. Um, caution about using ones that uh, have a short half-life, like alprazolam, um, uh, because there is increased risk of people develop tolerance to it, even people who don't have a substance use problem. Um, they may need higher doses of their SSRIs and SNRIs, meaning the doses that you normally give to a patient, you may have to give it to them longer than you would for depression and for longer treatment. Some patients, they don't wanna hear it, or maybe they, they know it and they're just having trouble accepting it. They may need to stay on medications for years. <laughs> Clowns scare people. I wanted to wake everybody up. Um, this is from the original It movie, um, talking about phobias. I just wanted to, to jolt everybody. Sorry. Novel treatments. Uh, so these are the different treatments that are on the market. We got, um, or not on the market, but on, under development. Um, and some have gone further to phase three trials, but we're still looking at whether or not some of these medications have a real future. By the way, all this stuff that I'm discussing is in an article that I wrote recently that was published in December, which I'm, we're going to send out with the handouts uh, of my slides. So don't feel like you know, you have to take everything down because this is basically covered pretty extensively in the article that I'm going to send to everybody. Um, serotonergic agents, these are both medications that are available and on the market and true, true for depression, but they have been studied in anxiety, but it's questionable whether or not there's much efficacy, um, especially, you know, with, um, I'm going to just call it Trintalic, sorry, but I can't pronounce the um, generic name, but they found that, um, there was potential promise in generalized anxiety disorder, but previous you know, follow-up studies didn't seem to support that. I, I, my feeling about these medications is, I don't know what benefit they really provide over what we already have, like these SSRIs, SNRIs, and Buspirone. So, and it's considering that they're more expensive, I mean, I think we need to take the time to see whether or not they're worth studying further. As Aperones, we already talked about, um, the only other two is Aperones are, are studied in other things, but Buspirone is the only one that's available right now, and it's approved for use. Agomelatine, I've seen a lot more about this, this drug. It was used for depression, and there was really good research that was being done for, for uh, using it in generalized anxiety disorder, but I haven't seen 
further follow up. I don't know if this is something that's being investigated further or being put for approval. It sort of seems like it's in a holding pattern, but I am curious and intrigued whether or not agomelatine has promise for anxiety disorders. I'm gonna talk very briefly hallucinogens. There's a, I'm hoping we have a talk about this because there's so much excitement and interest in hallucinogens. And I think this is an area of research that's gaining so much traction. Um, patients have asked about it repeatedly. They said, I read somewhere that it's being used to treat anxiety. And I point out that things like psilocybin and LSD are being used to, to, to for cancer anxiety or life-threatening disease related anxiety, and not for panic and generalized anxiety and social anxiety. I also caution people about being doing doing anything stupid like trying to buy these drugs on the on their own and taking them because these are being studied under very controlled settings where people are being given the medication in a very calm and comforting setting with staff support. Um, but there is research being done on psilocybin um, at Mount Sinai. They're developing a center to study hallucinogens for for treatment of psychiatric disorders. And I think the focus is primarily going to be on post traumatic stress, uh, where there's potential for a lot of research to be done on this, but I, I tell my patients to be patient. There was a hope many years ago in the 70s during, I think, the Nixon administration of the hallucinogen generations and like Timothy Leary, but there was a lot of uh, monkey wrenches thrown into this. And I think the psychiatry profession didn't push back against it. Um, but I am hoping now that it's gaining renewed interest that there may be some potential for this. Um, glutamate modulators like ketamine. I mean, We've already had so many speakers talk about ketamine. Dr. John Crystal came and gave a talk about using ketamine in post-traumatic stress. Dr. Murrow, a friend of mine, Dr. James Murrow at Mount Sinai talked about, you know, he was a, a resident of under me at, at Sinai. Now he's running the Mood Anxiety Program. He's doing great. They're studying ketamine. Uh, they're setting up at Yale. It's, it's become a very, you know, kind of hot topic. And obviously there's been interest in using it in other types of anxiety disorders like uh, generalized anxiety, social anxiety, but there's only one clinical trial, not a lot of research being done, unfortunately. And that's a shame. I hope that there's this trial on using IV ketamine was with Dr. Block up at Yale, um, but I'm hoping that it becomes an area of further investigation. Um, ketamine is a hallucinogenic medication. Um, there's obviously risks in causing potentially psychosis and dissociations, but um, I think it's being used in sub sub anesthetic doses. It potentially can have a lot of uh, of success, but it has to be studied further. Um, and as I mentioned, it comes in an intranasal, also in an IV form. And when I was doing research at Mount Sinai with Dr. Charney, we were giving people IV ketamine, and I have to say that it was one of the most remarkable things. There were cases of patients who just snapped out of the worst depressive states. So this is an anecdotal experience, but I found it to be incredibly effective potentially. Um, Decyclosarin, I'm only going to say that this is a medication that got a lot of attention for as an augmentation to exposure therapy and CBT for anxiety disorders. And uh, I've found that despite all the hubbub about how it can shorten the time to respond to treatment, it's not effective as, an, as a standalone treatment for, 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 for specific phobias or other types of anxiety disorders, but possibly as an augmentation approach. I look really carefully at the data, and it seems like it just did not stand up to the test of, of uh, you know, trying to verify and validate the original studies. So the larger scale studies didn't really pan out. Um, I haven't used it in my own clinical experience, even though it's well tolerated, I've been told. And it's just not something that I, I think has been all that effective. Nitrous oxide, this is an interest of mine because I've seen a lot of a lot more cases of nitrous oxide abuse. And I had a, written a paper about the toxicity of nitrous oxide, but um, in doing a kind of a deep dive, I found that there is research being done on using it for alcohol use disorders. And then there are some studies using it for dental anxiety, um, like you know, using some nitrous oxide to help patients with their anxiety. Um, obviously, as you can imagine, the abuse was, you know, initially a lot of it was through dentists who had access to it. Uh, but now you can buy these cartridges. You know, I remember when my father used to have those cartridges when he would make uh, um, carbonated beverages, uh, this yogurt drink that Iranians seem to drink, a, a carbonated yogurt drink. It sounds disgusting, I know, but it actually is quite good. Um, but yeah, these are readily available. And I know some states and some countries might be trying to restrict access to it. But I think the case study in using nitrous oxide and PTSD is compelling, and I'm interested in it. 
And I would love to, to see if there's any potential for research using nitrous oxide, given the fact that they're using ketamine, which is obviously a substance of abuse. So um, GABAergic medication, not a lot of research being done on like new GABA medications. Like there's obviously benzodiazepines and pregabalin and gabapentin, but they haven't done a lot of research on new medications because a lot of the research didn't pan out. Um, but here are two that are interesting. I remember learning about mifepristone when I was back at Mount Sinai. There was a group, a PTSD group, studying it. Um, but there's only one pilot study. I think because of its name and its role in pregnancy termination, I think there's a lot of stigma around using that medication. But I'm curious to see if there's going to be any potential further research on using it um, for anxiety disorders. This is the one below the pH 94B that I have a lot of ex excitement about because it's basically an as needed medication of what's called the PRN for social anxiety. And uh, uh, one of the people working on this was Michael Leibowitz, who again, you know, Dr. Leibowitz is a pioneer in social anxiety disorder, the social anxiety disorder scale that he developed is named after him. So he was the primary investigator on this research. So I'm, I'm keeping my eyes open. I'm hoping that we can see if there are medications like this that are developed like a neurosteroid and aerosol that can be used for treating people with anxiety. That's also not a controlled medication. Um, neuropeptides, there, uh, there's obviously a lot of interest in different types of neuropeptides. Oxytocin, uh, for Dr. Murata, this is for you. We, we worked on this project, augment, augmenting um, oxy, uh, clozapine with oxytocin sublingually. Um, and there's, I think, a lot of interest in, in that. And I'm, I'm just curious as to whether or not this can be applied for anxiety disorders, especially using a sublingual approach. So. I would say stay tuned. I'm hoping that this, you know, becomes an area of interest, but there's a lot of controversy about whether it accesses the blood brain barrier. We don't have blood levels. That's a problem with neuropeptides. You can't measure blood levels, but that's not necessarily a reliable approach. Um, also, the method of delivery is kind of tricky. People don't tend to like intranasal uh, medications. Uh, substance P, there's just not a lot of research being done on it. I was involved in a research trial on the substance P or neurokinin um, antagonist for PTSD that didn't really pan out. Um, not a lot to say about these. Orexin, which is a or uh, Belsamra, which is actually approved for uh, insomnia, but there's also a study of, of using it in panic disorder. But the problem is this medication is a, is a controlled medication. There can be some concerns about it. Um, cannabinoids, I'm just gonna rush through this, but basically marijuana is, is obviously the hot, you know, topic, you know, there are compounds that, you know, are found in marijuana. And obviously there's this whole push for medicalization and I could get into it, but we're going to have plenty of speakers talking about this. I think we've already had a few, but, you know, Dr. Levin's going to talk about cannabis more. I'll, I'm not going to steal her thunder, but basically people are pushing it for medicalization for trauma, PTSD, anxiety, insomnia, things of that nature, even though there is not great evidence for it. Um, and there's always some problems about giving someone a marijuana to smoke in terms of drug delivery and how effective, you know, how much you puff. Like, you know, we don't use tobacco cigarettes as a, as a medication, you know, so there are some inhalant medications and obviously nasal sprays, but, you know, we don't give people cigarettes to smoke laced with medication. So there's always a question about how much access people get, depending on how, the, how they smoke the drug. Um, there is evidence for use in pain and spasticity less evidence and support for nausea and vomiting based on uh, a, a large scale study in JAMA, but obviously it still has uh, you know, evidence in historical use, also in seizures. Um, but these are the compounds, um, the main ones that we wanna study. Cannabidiol or CBD comes in an oil primarily that can be put into gummies and various other things. Um, it's been studied in anxiety disorders. There's potential efficacy. The data is not terrible um, based on small studies, uh, but as I said, further work needs to be done in terms of safety concerns, um, especially the fact that this is all an unregulated field. This is not something that's under the uh, auspices of the FDA. And keep in mind, this is Schedule One. We're not even dealing with a drug that's that's you know it's it's not even supposed to be prescribed yet. And that's a whole question: will will the president or will the government change the scheduling of cannab cannabidiols or cannabis? And that's I don't know the answer to that, but that's a whole other issue. Basically, you have a statewide type thing, and there's no federal, you know, you know, rule on on whether it's legal or not. Uh, THC, the main component, which has increasingly become 
part of, of marijuana, there are higher concentrations of THC in marijuana than there were 30 years ago, which is a problem because THC can worsen anxiety and make people paranoid and potentially psychotic. Dr. D'Souza has talked extensively about the concerns about marijuana and risks of psychotic disorders and the chronic effects on cognition as well. Um, so you can find it. I don't know why anybody would want a CBD infused pillowcase. I, I don't know. I'm not my thing. I'm I'm not sure what why you need it in a lip balm or a. Um, but if you're interested, you know these products are available at Bed Bath and Beyond. Um, I'm just I tell my patients like maybe you know not take uh, trust in people who have a business interest, but also aren't beholden to you know state regulators and uh, licenses. You know we obviously have to answer to. To, uh, to, to higher authorities, and I don't mean God, I mean <laughs> talking about state medical boards um, and, and to, to lawyers. So, um, but I do find this all very interesting. Um, is it psychoactive? <laughs> I love how I hear ads for CBDs because it's not psychoactive. I'm like, well, but it's really effective for anxiety. I'm like, well, if it's not psychoactive, how is it gonna help anxiety? Just curious about that. Um, but yes, I, I do think that, um, there's a lot that doctors have to deal with in terms of contending with people who have a lot of money, strong lobbyists who are going out there telling patients that these treatments are effective. So whether or not you, you agree with it or disagree with it, we're gonna have to contend with it. And my feeling is let's bring them to the table and tell them, okay, let's do research. Let's see what you, you got um, and let's regulate it. Because if we're gonna, if we're gonna have patients take it, I want it to be regulated. Um, natural remedies, I would say that, um, Kava is probably the one with the best evidence, but there are many, many ones that have been studied over the years, but Kava Kava has probably the strongest evidence, but I'd be careful about liver toxicity. Also, the important thing is that you don't know what you're getting when you buy something at a, at a GNC or a Walgreens, you don't know what's in the pills. And so if you're gonna buy supplements, I always recommend going to looking online, there's some reputable places or some companies that will only prescribe it through doctors. So there are options you can find, but here are some of the medications that are available. Saffron, I find very funny because as, a, as an Iranian, a Persian American, I, you know, we put saffron in everything. Uh, turmeric is another one that people love to, to use for, for inflammatory effects. But these are things that patients, l is one that patients ask a lot about. I don't think that there's serious concerns about safety. I think valerian is the one I'd be careful about because it is a very similar to benzodiazepines. Um, but most of these are fairly safe. It's just, we, even though there are studies that show efficacy and these are legitimate studies in, you know, in, in medical journals, I don't think that you know, we, we know enough about it from large cell studies and whether there's a placebo effect, but I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, so I wanna show this to you. This was the paper that I'm gonna send out to everybody and this is the paper that I wrote uh, in 2014 with Dr. Uh, Yosef Escu and Dr. Murrow. And unfortunately, in the last, you know, whatever the time was, six years between those two papers, there wasn't a lot of, uh, of new medications on the pipeline. Like, I obviously, we didn't just cut and paste from the old paper, but we, we could have because there wasn't a lot of new data, unfortunately. Um, and it was kind of disappointing. We need to continue to expand and look at novel pathways like glutamate drugs, phytochemicals, you know, herbal medication, neurosteroids, psychedelics. For now, we need to continue using the standby drugs, but I still think that there should be a look at the new pathways and also trying to increase access to CBT and exposure therapy. I think not enough patients have access to good therapists and insurance won't pay for it. There's a whole parity act but patients are getting their care from primary care doctors who are giving people psychiatric medications and in some cases giving them medications without doing a good substance history. So it's a problem. Um, so I, very quickly, this is my son. And back in um, you know, front, almost a year and a half ago, right before my high school reunion, I 25 year high school reunion, um, my son, this is two days before, was eating my hospital ID and I was getting ready to take him to school. And I took this picture. Um, th th that night he got violently ill and I could not think about anything other than I don't wanna get sick, I don't wanna get sick, I don't wanna get sick. And a few hours before I was getting ready to drive into New York City for my reunion, I got sick. And what I realized is that having a, a child is the best kind of exposure therapy manageable because this boy will put anything in his mouth and he will try to feed me 
with anything that you know, he's eating, he will try to put it in my mouth. And I've learned that over time, I don't want my son to end up staring off, scared uh, of the world, scared to eat, scared to climb on, on rocks, scared to put his hands and eat grass or do whatever, you know, disgusting little children do. But I, I, I definitely love the fact that um, he's fearless and I'm going to encourage his fearlessness and maybe he can encourage me to be more fearless as well. Uh, and he has, and I think it's great. Um, not to say it's easy. The thing to remember, anxiety is never easy. It's still hard. Um, but I think that um, it's it's been really rewarding. Learning about anxiety has made me more aware of my own pathologies and my coworkers can definitely attest to my quirks. But I think you know having a child has been a real help in making me more self-aware and more able to confront it. Um, so that's been great. Uh, this is me, I am done. Thank you so much. Hope I didn't go too fast, but we have time for questions now. Dr. Gerber. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amir. It, it, it really was a tour de force. I mean, you did not disappoint. From Mel Brooks all the way to adorable pictures of your son, you, you, ha you have spanned uh, um, uh, uh, the gamut and uh, really, I think, done justice to a, a very large and complicated topic, but in a way that has taught us a tremendous amount. And, it is not hard to imagine, I'm sure everybody would agree, why you win teaching awards uh, when we get to see how, how great a teacher you are and how thoughtful you are uh, uh, about these complex topics. So I could keep going, but I'm going to get right to the questions because there's a bunch of uh, postings already, uh, as I'm not surprised. And uh, I know people are eager to hear your thoughts about some of them. So let me start with a comment from a uh, uh, former medical director uh, um, and President Richard Francis, who uh, as you know, is a big fan of yours and, and uh, uh, noted uh, what, what a loss it is for Silver Hill, but, but congratulated you on your new job. But let me read you his comment and get, you, get your thoughts. He says, unfortunately, many experts in anxiety disorders are pro-benzodiazepine experts. I'll, I'll read the name even, including Nemiroff. I feel all medical, um, uh, including psychiatric residents and medical students, are not sufficiently taught of risks, especially in substance abuse patients and the elderly. Addiction experts deal with the results of this overprescription and understand the risks better in my experience. This needs further research. And this is coming, by the way, if you don't know it, if you know it, but if others don't know it, uh, you know, Dr. Francis was one of the founders of the American uh, um, um, Association for Addiction Psychiatry, so very experienced in the field. What are, I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Well, I actually had a conversation with Dr. Francis about this, about that paper that I wrote, because he wrote a response to the paper uh, on, on teaching, and I talked to him about it in an APA meeting, and, you know, he was sort of like, well, why didn't you, you know, raise the alarms about this more in the paper? And I said, well, the reviewers skewered my, um, my paper because of that. I agree with him. I can tell you, I taught residents when I taught them about benzodiazepines, about the risk. And I feel like at Mount Sinai, at least the residents are very much aware. And I always ask them when I continue to teach, I stopped teaching Psychopharm a while back. It just was too many things on my plate. But I think that there, this is being taught. The issue is more, I think that there isn't consistency across residency programs. I really think that they need to develop a curriculum. Um, and I know the American Society of Clinical Psychopharmacology uh, it has like a, a curriculum guideline, but I think unfortunately residents tend to learn uh, on the floors and their experiences with their supervisors. And maybe during residency, some people have supervisors that are kind of pro benzo and, and they're like, oh, you should give these medications. And they kind of learn. I also think in the paper I, I talked about this is that patients are very persuasive. As you know, Dr. Gerber, they can be very pushy, <laughs> manipulative, demanding of medications. I dealt with this yesterday with a patient, you know, I'm very angry that I wouldn't put them back on benzodiazepines. And I, I feel as if, you know, doctors sometimes want to sort of appease the patients. But I agree that um, if you deal with overprescription, especially the risk with patients with substance use disorders, I mean, I can tell you, I got burned. I had a patient who was at Silver Hill. She asked after a long time trying many different anti-anxiety approaches to go back on clonazepam. I put her back on it. She seemed fine, but then things got worse and she relapsed and she didn't blame the benzodiazepine, but now we were kind of stuck getting her off of it. And, you know, Silver Hill had a hard time. She switched to a different doctor. This doctor had a hard time. And you're right, you, you, people end up on these medications and it becomes sort of a, a revolving door of like different doctors and cycles. And I think it's really hard, but I agree that, you know, I'm looking at his question is that 
yeah, th th there was a lot of money to be made on benzodiazepines. My father told me they used to, and I actually witnessed that, they used to give out drugs of samples of from rugby pharmaceuticals of Valium. And I remember they had a little heart in the middle, it looked like candy. It's a good thing, you know, I think he never dropped on the ground in the house. Kids would eat them. I mean, they're just, and I do think that th there is definitely not enough emphasis put on both sides, which is the, the risk to patients with substance use disorders. And also patients who don't have substance use disorders to tell them like, this isn't a long-term solution, I think. I really don't. And yes, I have some patients who take benzodiazepines chronically, but I don't think they're meant to be long-term uh, use anymore. I think that we move beyond that. I mean, it's a, what you say is, it rings so true. And, and, and you know, I, I don't know that there's any data for this, but, but I just imagine that there's some relationship between the shortness of doctor visit and the prescription rates of, of benzos. If you're a primary care doctor and you have 50 patients in your waiting room and you have five minutes with each, uh, you can understand the, the short-term incentive to use benzos to get onto the next patient. Where, whereas if you have more time, you, you can obviously try to treat the root more. Um, one last comment from, from Dr. Francis though, I did wanna mention is he said, bravo to you for, for, for talking about your own experience. And, and I wanted to say that uh, for myself as well, because I think uh, we're entering a new era where, where psychiatrists like us uh, are able to talk about our own issues in a way that, that humanizes us. And, and, and I think that that's a really positive development. So thank you for leading the way. Uh, so Dr. Uh, Ken Verve uh, here in New Canaan uh, had a couple comments that I wanted to get your thoughts on. For, uh, his first comment is, isn't it critical to consider time of onset and half-life in prescribing benzos, varying addictive potential, that is the range from alprazolam uh, to clonopin? So why don't I give you that one first and then and he has more questions after. Yeah, so obviously that, that's very important to consider. I mean, one of the issues, the reason that patients like alprazolam is because the, the rapid onset. And I do find that with clonazepam, that is an issue. Sometimes patients who are having a panic attack um, want some immediate relief. So there are, there are situations where I, I know I said I don't, it's not that like I never prescribe alprazolam, but for, for, for long-term chronic use, I just think that clonazepam is a better choice because of its long half-life. People don't develop rebound anxiety as much with the clonazepam. And I found that I have a patient right now, she's on alprazolam from another doctor who came to me and she gets terrible rebound. So she's dosing more often during the day. And I think that's, that's even though she needs immediate relief, I think it becomes a problem. I know they have an extended release alprazolam, which I tried to encourage patients to use if they're gonna take it, but um, I, I assume that the, the time of onset might be different, but I think it is important. I think it's absolutely, I mean, you know, my preference is to have people on longer acting benzodiazepines. So given the choice, I, if I have to prescribe a benzodiazepine, I prefer to use clonazepam because it definitely of the benzodiazepines has the least amount of addiction potential. Um, so I would agree with that. Great. I, I, I was always taught uh, that, that the, the best use of alprazolam is keeping it in your pocket and never <laughs> it out because it, it gives at least the, set, the fantasy of, of quick relief but actually the best way is not to ever, ever use it for the reasons you just said. Yeah. Um, so let, let me go into to Dr. Berg's next comment. He said, what about relaxation response, such as self-hypnosis, meditation for panic attacks, uh, and, and generalized anxiety more generally? He says, many patients with panic attacks are excellent subjects for self-hypnosis. Let me just pair this with his next comment. He says, for those unfamiliar with her works, the Australian psychiatrist Claire Weeks has a series of self-help books for anxiety patients which are extremely helpful. The language and titles, Hope and Help for Your Nerves is old school, but they are very special. Any thoughts about that? Yes, so I absolutely agree. And that is what I, I meant to say by like taking behavioral therapy responses, teaching people breathing, meditation. I try to encourage people to meditate. I have tried meditating. It's kind of hard, especially, um, you know, getting peace and quiet at home. But I do find that that the relaxation response are definitely effective. and. Uh, and in terms of self-hypnosis, um, I, I, as, as one of my supervisors used to say, all hypnosis is self-hypnosis. Uh, but yeah, I agree, absolutely. I think these are definitely powerful approaches. And I've had patients who do well with cognitive therapy and these relaxation techniques, exercise. I know Dr. Berg didn't mention that, but I'm a big believer in, in cardiovascular exercise to help relieve anxiety and patients do remarkably well with it. I also saw Dr. Burb had asked about like the father of psychopharm. I saw the question. 
Yes, I, I'm only quoting what the New York Times obit said about um, <laughs> about Don Klein. I know Nathan Klein obviously, uh, you know, has an institute named after him. Is obviously that, and I know that Dr. Burr asked another question about or comment about like being pro benzo, pro SSRI. I I would say that I'm not pro anything. I'm pro patient. I agree. I I that's why I think it's not good to be so you know, stuck on like, well, I'm not going to give people benzodiazepines. I have a colleague who's a friend of mine. Um, he's like, I never prescribe them to patients. I was like, what do you mean never? Like that's like, if you have, there's situations where it might warrant it. I mean, I don't think it's, it's good to take such a rigid approach. Actually, I have to say one of the people who was instrumental in bringing me around on being less rigid was Dr. Collins, Eric Collins, who used to be chief of staff here, who was, as you will know, is a very well-regarded addiction psychiatrist. But his view is, I think you have to stop with the rigidity. Like people would come into Silver Hill, we would immediately take them off their benzodiazepines. I mean, that's risky is given that some of these patients take these medications for years. So, but I do think that, you know, I, I also know that some people ask the question like, well, how do you manage patients who they don't want to use skills and breathing and relaxation? And how do you convince them? I'm like, you have to, it's a time process. You have to gain their trust and try to encourage them over time to work towards what I think are going to be long-term, more effective and safer strategies than taking a pill. Great. So I'm going a little bit out of order here, but I, but I want to uh, uh, pick up a question uh, that was just asked. Uh, I am um, seeing so much abuse of gabapentin and Seroquel with dual diagnosis clients. I'm a therapist and docs keep giving these in high doses with limited oversight. It's hard to do therapy with this kind of sedation. What do you think of that? I think that's an excellent point. And I have found that there is such a dif difficult line to walk as a psychiatrist with patients. And I, I teach about the biology of addiction. I've actually run a group, of, you know, monthly for patients. Um, and it is an issue because the patients will say, I have so much discomfort. I can't do the skills work or the therapy. I can't handle the programming. So we sedate them into oblivion. I mean, Dr. Gerber, you know that recently we dealt with a patient like this who just wanted to be, you know, it's like that song by the Ramones, I want to be sedated. Is that how it goes? Uh, you know, it's, it's like I, I tell patients that, that you need to learn how to sit with discomfort. And I agree, this therapist is right. I mean, I, I've been culprit of this too because the patients come to me and say, like, I can't function. But this goes to my point about how, um, first of all, both gabapentin and quetiapine are, uh, are not uh, used in jails and prisons because there is concern about abuse. Um, so there is a lot of strictness in terms of the environment. There are certain facilities and programs that don't want patients you know, taking these medications, like residential programs, because there is abuse potential. But I, I think that we also have to contend with patients, especially those with dual diagnoses, like how do we manage their anxiety? So my approach would be to try to move them away from medications just to sedate their feelings and discomfort and move them towards SSRIs and SNRIs. And I know some people may caught at that and say, well, those medications, the research evidence on them is not necessarily so great. I'm like, well, then CBT. <laughs> I just think that in terms of long-term risks, I think, you know, Seroquel in particular, quetiapine, I don't think we're really aware about what kind of risk and the people who take the medication don't understand about weight gain and metabolic syndrome and all these other things. So I think we need to do a better job as doctors of being judicious with prescribing and not just to protect ourselves from a lawsuit, but also just to, to make sure we don't have, we're not medicating people into oblivion. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So we're coming up on our time, but, but I'm going to take a, a host prerogative to ask you a question before we close out which is you know, one of the things that's always interested me, and, and I'm curious both your clinical experience or any research to, to bear on this, is how do you decide when, when you're weighing about the primacy of therapy or medication in a patient? In other words, uh, how do you make the judgment as to whether some, to, to suggest somebody start with therapy or start with medication? Um, you know, people think of them differently, but I'm, I'm curious how you approach that question. Well, interestingly, I think that every patient I bring in, I want them to get into therapy concurrently. The, the problem is, is that I, I try to gauge the, the patient's reluctance to take medication. The patients who do therapy primarily are the ones who are, have a lot of resistance or fear about potential side effects of medications. I think the ones who are averse to the idea of taking medications, I tend to gear more towards cognitive therapy. But then I have a whole school of people who, for whatever reasons, time, money, simply don't want to engage in cognitive therapy. But I've realized I've shifted my view in the last few years towards, I want everyone to get cognitive therapy. The problem is 
I, 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 it's, you have to find people who are skilled at doing cognitive behavioral therapy in real, like I'm talking about Dave Barlow, you know, Judith Beck, Aaron Beck type of CBT, like Dave Barlow teaches at, at Boston University of Psychology to like panic control therapy. And I learned under Cindy Aronson, who was at Mount Sinai, and she trained with Barlow on, on this type of approach. But if you, if you don't find a good therapist who knows how to do these things, I think it becomes kind of a problem. I mean, sending someone to just any random therapist to say, do therapy for anxiety, is can be, can be even more detrimental, I think, to the patient. So my approach is to, to offer both. And But if I'm going to tell the person the patient's interested in therapy, I'll tell them you have to make a commitment. And some patients, they don't want to make that commitment. So that's, unfortunately, it becomes dependent on the user. <laughs> um, but uh, I think that maybe we're not doing a good enough job of pushing the psychotherapy on patients. Not pushing it, but encouraging patients to go down that road, because I think there are situations where people can do better without having to go on medications and the effects could be more durable potentially. So I guess my approach is really dependent on the user and their, their willingness. Fantastic, well, great. Well, listen, there's lots of comments to, uh, expressing their appreciation and I wanna close out by expressing my appreciation, Amir, not just for this wonderful talk today and training, but for all that you've taught me and us at Silver Hill for all the amazing care you've taken of, of patients here and to tell you that your wish is granted. You will never be outside the Silver Hill family. <laughs> and we look forward to having you on uh, Grand Rounds and inviting you back and being involved in, in, uh, in our future uh, and celebrate your new role at Greenwich Hospital. So thank you, Amir. Thanks everybody for joining. And we look forward to seeing you all at the next Grand Rounds. Bye, thank everybody. you.